So hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Out of Spec Reviews. You know, Kyle called me up and said, hey dad, it's been 10 days since you've owned the car. Um, and what car? Oh, the Ionic 5, there it is. And I thought I would drive up over here to New Canaan or Waveney. Beautiful, this is not my house, I wish it were. Uh, it's actually a town park now. Uh, but I will say that it's kind of an appropriate thing that this car is, uh, that I'm filming in here because Doc from Back to the Future this was his grandparents' estate. And uh, this car is sort of like me going back to the future or back to the past in the 80s. So I'm loving the car. I wanna go over some of the things that I find from a daily driving standpoint I'm enjoying about this car. And um, you know, amazing, amazing car. So let's get into it. I'll take you through some of the things, some of my driving impressions about how I'm doing with the car, what I like, maybe what I don't like. and. Um, and remember, I'm coming from the ID4 to the Ionic 5, so this one is going to be a fun one. So everybody enjoy. So let's start with what happens when you approach the car. You walk up to it, you've got the key fob in your pocket, and you walk up to the car, and what happens? It detects the fact that your key fob is in. It unlocks the car. The mirrors unfold, especially, you know, obviously, that's a setting that you can have. If you walk away from the car, the car locks itself again. But one of the things that was kind of funny on the ID4 was the detection of the key fob was not anywhere near as sensitive as it is with this car, this little square button here. I always used to find myself, depending on the whereabouts of the key fob, if it was in my right pocket, let's just say, and I walked up to the car with my left leg near the car, I'd have to actually spin around. I called it the ID4 dance because I don't know what it was, but it, it, it was very interesting how uh, the ID4 would not really pick up the key fob as much as this one does. This is a lot more sensitive. Um, one of the things you'll notice here on this limited trim is the fact you have seat memory, seat memory one and seat memory two, which is great. The one thing I don't like about the seat memory is you know how oftentimes what you do is you set the seat, uh, you set the mirrors while you're driving. This car will not let you save the memory to the memory, any kind of adjustments that you make while you're driving. You actually have to be stopped in order to um, have those seat memories be memorized. I think that's a little, a little silly. Um, so that's kind of a, a crazy thing. One of the other things about this car is the app itself is so much more reliable than the app on the ID4 was. And uh, for, so a simple thing that I, I live with every single day in the morning, it's kind of cold out here in Connecticut, and uh, you want to start up your car from inside the house, I would say no, oh, probably around 25% of the time, uh, the ID4 remote app would work. This car, the remote app has worked every single time, which I think is, uh, which is great. Now, let me turn the car on for a second here, and I wanna show you this graphic in the center. Um, the first thing that I don't like is the fact that you'll see that you've got these different um, regeneration levels down here. It starts up in level three. What ends up happening is, if you want to keep the car in eye pedal, it never remembers that uh, that's where you lost last left it. So I find myself always having to, oh, we just switched to night mode, you can see. I have it set the the, uh, the screen. I've, I've seen some things online where people like night mode all the time versus the white screens. I sort of like the white screens. Um, you notice I have a, a cheap suction mount phone uh, mount right here, magnetic. Uh, I've ordered a special phone mount that goes uh, right in between the two screens from proclip.com. It's customized specifically to grab onto the Ionic 5. Right now they're currently back ordered. Um, you'll see I've got the, um, the radar detector up there, the Max 360C, which is fine. Uh, the only thing I don't like is the mute button on this, uh, this power port is so far down that you really got to bend over when that thing goes off and you kind of want to mute it. Not a, not a huge deal. Um, I may actually decide to mount the radar detector up in here and do something custom, although I'm not sure. And, uh, you know, of course I've got my, 
my uh, my display here, uh, the way that I've actually changed this uh, or mounted this is with uh, some giant magnets I bought on the back uh, uh, off of Amazon for like seven dollars, and it and it really holds it uh, very well right there. The one thing I want to caution, and I have to make sure that this this uh, this power cord stays. I once got out and clipped the power cord with my foot, which ripped the this little screen off of the magnetic mounts and I actually got a crack in it so very amateur move on my on my part um, you know uh, this this graphic in the center that shows where the power is going to um, I'm already in drive here but you'll notice that when you start to give it some uh, acceleration it'll show you the where the power is going whether it's to the rear wheels or to the front wheels and uh, if it's taking energy from the battery and putting it out to uh, the tires or the wheels, or if it's actually taking energy from the regeneration and putting it back into the battery. And I remember this feature from, uh, I had a couple of Priuses years ago, and I liked watching that graphic. I, I thought that was was uh, pretty good. And, and of course you can see uh, I've got the um, tire pressure, if you just flip through this little menu right here. There's lots of deep menus, um, uh, but I, I do enjoy that, that graphic as to where, where the power is going on and where it's going, um, where it's being sent to. Uh, a lot of people have complained about how do you actually turn on the heated seats and it's a big deal, but you know, one of the things you all, all you have to do is click this warmer button right here, boom, and then this menu comes up and right, if you push up here, then you got your heated seats all the way from three to two to one. And then if you go to zero, that's off. And then if you go down to the, uh, to the downside, this is where you get the cooled seats. So you can't have the heat and the air blowing at the same time in this car, which I think you can in certain cars, but uh, that's a, a really nice feature that this limited has both heated and cooled seats. And again, this is where you're, you access the heated steering wheel. So I, I think that's, um, that's very good. Uh, now, there is no way to lock this glove box. Uh, and, you know, I thought about, well, I could actually put some valuables up in the front. Um, but then I was talking to Kyle about that, and he said that there are, you know, some uh, I guess uh, ways to get into the the front of the the trunk, perhaps in an emergency setting or something like that. Um, so that's something maybe I don't know. I'm not really sure, but it's interesting to me that you can't you can't lock that glove box. Uh, another thing that I do enjoy, I know as silly as it sounds, but I've got four window switches and coming off of uh, an ID four, or I used to just hit this rear button over here on the ID four. And, uh, you know, then you would put down the front window and then you'd end up putting down the rear window, which was kind of strange, but, um, you know, look, it, it, this is nice having four window switches. I'm, I'm kind of glad to getting back to that. Um, Let's see, what else can I talk about here? Um, the, uh, oh yeah, this, uh, this, this tuning button here, it does not work uh, with CarPlay, which I find interesting. Um, but what, what I've done is I've actually set this star button here as a, a custom button that goes back to the default and uh, default screen. And then when I actually have CarPlay, when my phone is plugged in, I can actually, um, uh, utilize CarPlay, which I love, and I and I've got um, you know access to uh, Spotify and and Waze right in there. And this screen is actually quite large, which I like. Um, another thing that a lot of people mentioned is that because of the way that they're now, this camera is right at my eyes right now, and I'm six foot five, so I'm not a small guy. Uh, but a lot of people are, have been saying that when they sit in the car. This is what they see, so they they can't see the speed um, or or how many miles are left. In my case, because I'm tall and because I've got the steering wheel in the in the position that it's in, uh, I don't have an issue. But I also I'm not sure if you can actually see, but in the windshield you can see the heads up display, uh, which which shows the speedometer up in there. 
So, so let me talk a little bit more about this heads up display. Uh, I want to go over to two settings for this heads up display. If you go to setup, you go to vehicle, you go to head up display, you'll notice that there are two modes to the heads up display. One is standard mode and the other is augmented reality mode. Now, um, I actually think I like the standard mode better. Um, it, it seems to show, you won't see it here because I'm just sitting in the parking lot, but it seems to show a lot more data in terms of, uh, you know, if there are cars around you. Um, and and it's, it's, it's a lot more intuitive to me, I think, in standard mode. The augmented reality kind of shows like this little blob coming up and, and going in front of you, and that's supposed to be a car, as opposed to what I'm used to in the Tesla or even the ID4 where it actually shows pictures of little cars or cars or, you know, if it's a bicycle in the Tesla or a person, it shows you pretty clearly what it is. But, um, you know, I think the standard mode is is kind of a better way for uh you know for for at least for me um in terms of in terms of the uh let me back up this right here when you're putting on your turn signal you'll see this video camera pop up which shows you a video image of what's on your left hand side in this case um, it also shows you in the heads up display a uh, a graphic if there is a car in your blind spot, it will actually show you like a red mark over there. And then in addition to that, you've also got a uh, an indicator in the mirror uh, as to whether or not there's a car in your blind spot. So I really like the safety uh, features that, that are built into this, um, into this car. Parking brake automatically engaged. Look at that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, the parking brake is, is right over here. I guess you pull that. Um, and I, I imagine it's uh, just just because I've been sitting here for for a little while. Uh, compared to the ID4, there's you know there's a lot of piano black here, uh, but one of the things that I really like is this. It's a simple knob for the volume, which is which is great. I'm still getting used to this push button, you know, start stop compared to the Teslas, but I guess that's that's what it is. And the stock in terms of uh, putting the car in gear or in park or in reverse, um, you know, very similar to what like say the I3 or the ID4 is, is like. And I was in the city the other day in a parking garage and finally I think uh, a lot of the parking attendants are, are understanding uh, how, how all that works. Um, so um, one of the other things that's interesting is this is a, a, a camera uh, mode that, that shows you um, sort of interesting imagery uh, one of the things you can do is pretty cool graphic. You can spin this around and look at your car, which I like to do. Um, the one thing is that I don't have a white car. Um, I wish I could change the color of the car. No, I'm kidding. That's That would be a silly thing. But, um, you know, the, the one thing is that this camera comes on with the 360 degree view like that. And then when you're backing up, it really helps you um, with the guidelines in terms of the backup. But the thing is that the camera does not work, and I tested this, unless you're going five miles an hour or under, which is kind of interesting to me. Oh yeah, this is kind of an interesting thing I, I have I found. The auto steer function from the dynamic cruise control. There are two separate buttons on this car which is interesting. Now in a Tesla, what happens is on the stock, you'll push it down once to invoke dynamic cruise control. And then you'll push it down twice if you want to invoke the dynamic cruise plus the auto steer. Uh, but one thing you can't do in the Tesla that you can do in this car is you can't actually invoke the auto steer without having the dynamic cruise in, in, uh, invoked as well. And, and I sort of like this feature of decoupling the dynamic cruise from the auto steer. I like it a lot, as a matter of fact, because I, I tend, uh, you know, when you're on these parkways or, um, and you know, when you're in a, in a, um, situation where you want to change the number of, of spaces or distance between yourself and the car in front of you. This has a setting, uh, It's I believe it's four different levels of closeness, uh, how close you can travel. But sometimes you're just better off using the accelerator to keep that gap in front of you based on the amount of traffic. But you 
you still want to have the auto steer. And, and what this what this Ionic 5 does is it allows you to actually decouple the dynamic cruise from the auto steer and use the auto steer and then manually provide the acceleration. I really, really like that feature um, quite a bit. And, and speaking of this um, auto steer function, this particular car, along with the SEL, has what's called um, uh, HDA2, which I guess is um, Hyundai driver assistance or highway driver assistance level two. And it's got some uh, advanced features. I believe that in order to change lanes in a Tesla, it's a, you have to have FSD in addition to autopilot. And that's a $12,000 option. Um, it used to be $3,000. I remember on one of the Model 3s I paid for. And that, that feature stays with the car um, as, as ownership transfers. But, you know, not a big deal when it's $3,000. But now that it's $12,000... Um, I could care less about driving in the city and having the car actually drive itself in the city. To me, uh, that's just not something that I think we're there yet. It, uh, I, I believe that's dangerous, to be honest. Maybe it isn't, but for me, it, it is. But the one feature that I do like uh, with FSD on a Tesla is, is changing lanes uh, on highway. And HDA2, which is included in both the SEL and the Limited, that includes uh, automatic lane changes and it's very smooth and it works out uh, very well. The SE does not have uh, HDA2, it's got HDA1. Basically, it just doesn't have uh, this, um, this feature of lane changes. Now there's another feature that, um, that the uh, HDA2 has over HDA1 in the Ionic. And what that is, is, is it's artificial intelligence so that, I don't know if you've ever been in a Tesla when you're, you're running on the highway, you're doing whatever speed it is, let's say 70 miles an hour, of course in a 70 mile an hour zone. And, um, and let's say there's a truck, you're in the left hand lane and there's a truck on the, in the right hand lane. And the car, the Tesla tends to actually go closer to the, to the truck. And uh, there's a term for this called truck lust. Um, I guess it just, you know, likes the truck and it starts inching over towards the truck. Well, the Hyundai system has something called, I call it scoot. So it's artificial intelligence, supposedly. I mean, AI is one of the most abused terms going, but, but this HDA2 has sophisticated technology built into it that it actually, if it detects a car either to the left or to the right, but let's say the car, you're cruising down, you're passing a car on the left, the car is on the right that you're passing. What it will do is it will actually scoot the car over to the left and keep a little bit more of a safe distance from the car that you're passing. And uh, I, I really I really like that feature uh, a lot. Um, I think that's a pretty sophisticated feature. In fact, I was looking in one of the menus earlier, I can't find it now, but I think there's a way that you can actually adjust with HDA2 where the car is positioned in the lane. Um, so is it, 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 let's just say, is it hugging the left-hand side or is it hugging the right-hand side? I think you can actually adjust that similar to the heads-up display where you can actually adjust the angle this way or this way, or not only up and down. Um, I have to play with that a little bit more uh, to, to confirm that that is true. Uh, but but I think that uh, I did see that somewhere and I was trying to test it out a little bit earlier um, And I thought that was pretty wild one of the other things that I found uh, and I mentioned earlier that I am six foot five but uh, you know with this with the uh, the way that this Hatch opens and you do get an auto open and auto close hatch, which is nice I mean, it's not the end of the world, but uh, I'm six five and I fit pretty well under here without banging my head. I don't have to duck that much. And uh, I thought that was a pretty well designed car because to me, or feature, because this car is not super high. Um, it's still, to me, this is not an SUV. This this to me is, is more of a car, but um, you know, that's one of the things that I, um, that I, I found pretty good. One of the other features that I do like about this car, uh, as opposed to the ID4 is, let me see if I can get this open. You'll notice that the uh, CCS door, uh, power door for where you're gonna plug in and charge, it actually is power. And one of the, the silliest things I always used to do, because I'm so used to, again, to a Tesla, when I had the Volkswagen, 
I would actually unplug at the EA station and uh, and then go in the car to drive away. And of course, this this little gate, this little door would remain open. And today, after I charged, one of the things that I was very happy about was that that little charge port door actually closed on its own. Now, of course, you can see the, the printout here, the readout as far as how much charge you have, um, and you can hit close here. But I left it open deliberately uh, to see if it would automatically close if I, let's say, pretended that I forgot to close it. And in fact, it did. So I thought that that was a, uh, a really, really good feature. Um, one last thing that I just want to point out in terms of some of the smaller things. Uh, the headlights at night, they're okay. They're not great. They look cool. I mean, look at, the, you know, all this, this, I just, you know, this is such a wild looking car, but when you look at the pixels everywhere in this car um, and the design, it's very cool, but they're not anything to write home about in terms of uh, brightness or anything like that. Um, and again, I like the bright work on the Limited with the uh, silver uh, around the, the, the rims, the wheels, and down in the lower cladding. I think that looks uh, really fantastic. Um, I have washed this car once only. I should say I rinsed it off once uh, at, a, at a manual car wash, and, and uh, it got pretty clean. Uh, I've got the Dr. Beasley's kit, which I'm going to do an unboxing of in a separate video, uh, probably tomorrow, just to kind of uh, take a look at what's in the kit and what do they instruct you to do. It's more than just a, you know, a wash that comes with the Beasley kit. It's, I think it's something on a borderline of a ceramic coating that uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna put it on there myself and see what happens. And then they also include some sort of spot sprayer for any kinds of things that you get on the car. Um, I actually wanted to show you one last thing is that the subwoofer back here, it actually takes up quite a bit of room under the, this uh, floor, which, uh, which does have some room underneath there but not a lot. And uh, the sound system's good. Um, definitely better than the, than the ID4 sound system. It's kind of weird because it seems like you got to turn it up a lot. And if you're one of these people that says, oh, I don't want to have it on 50 out of 100 or 60 out of 100, um, you kind of need to turn it up if you really want to crank the tunes uh, between, I would say, 55 and 65. Um, someone told me it only goes to 75, which is weird. I don't know why you'd have a system that would only go to 75. But look, the stereo is, is definitely good, the Bose stereo on the limited trim. Um, and when you add up all the things that you get with the limited versus the SEL, uh, I personally, I think it's, it's definitely worth the money. Um, the glass roof alone is, is very cool. And uh, being tall, I would say six foot five and uh, a little bit longer back than perhaps legs, uh, the added headroom that I have with this glass roof comes in quite handy. I don't find myself, even when I was, the other day I was wearing a baseball cap and I didn't find that the, um, that the uh, headroom was, was an issue at all. Um, I do feel, and Kyle and I, we were talking about this the other day, when you're sitting in the car, the, this, this side right here feels like you're hunkered down pretty good, but the way that the dashboard is so low and the way that the hood falls away from the car it gives you tremendous visibility of the road out in front of you but you do feel like you wish you could put the seat down another couple of inches and um, I think that that's something I may go to a body shop and see if there's a way to lower this seat a little bit more I know it'll probably be prohibitively expensive but again being six foot five this uh, this little seat function right here that comes out um, if you push this button it comes out and it's supposed to be like a lazy boy recliner and maybe you could take a snooze or a nap but because my legs are so long my legs don't even touch that thing it's completely worthless to me um, I think it looks cool. Um, and again, in the United States, 
this function only comes on the driver's side, whereas I think in some other markets, perhaps in Europe, you're able to uh, have that function on both sides. But I mean, look, that's not a big deal. That's uh, not really too big of an issue. Um, so yeah, I mean, look, great car. I'm enjoying it tremendously. It is uh, a lot of fun to drive. Uh, I've taken it on, we took it all the way out to my father-in-law's house on Long Island. Very enjoyable, very smooth, very quiet. And what was also interesting was when we actually, Kyle and I, after we had driven up in the ID4 from JFK 10 days ago, uh, noticeably quieter than the ID4. Um, and I'm not sure why, because these tires are quite wide. I mean, these are 255 on the width side, and these are 20 inch wheels. But uh, look, minor differences between the ID4, what I would say to you is that uh, you gotta like the styling. Um, when I first saw this car, I didn't like it, um, but it's really grown on me. And I do like the angular lines. It grew on me before I bought it. But even since I've owned it, I just really like it. And it's a lot of fun. I must tell you that it is a looker uh, when I drive down the road. Not that I'm looking for attention, but people just, they look at it, they point at it. They say, wow, look at that thing. That is wild. Maybe they saw it on the Super Bowl commercial, or maybe that's something they hadn't seen before and they're not sure what it is. It's definitely different, definitely an interesting thing. But uh, so I guess, the next part of the video, what I want to do is a quick zero to 60. Uh, one of the things that you'll see is I have this, uh, this, little, this little pad over here with all kinds of data. And uh, I plugged in the VPeak uh, OBD scanner uh, right there, 25 bucks on Amazon. Uh, pretty good, lots of data. If you like data, get that, get the scanner, get the screen. And uh, there's a function on there that allows you to test acceleration, zero to 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, whatever you wanna do. And I'm gonna try that out. So let's see what happens with that. All right, so off in the Ionic 5, it's time to go find a place where we can do a zero to 60 test. And I thought it would be good to maybe just drive a little bit um, and share my thoughts or impressions as I, I'm driving over, probably most likely going to check out the, the Merritt Parkway. I think there's a spot that I can um, put this bad boy in sport mode. Now, I'm only at, what am I at? 45% percent state of charge right now. So this will be, how do I say, probably not the best, most powerful test. But what's interesting is I've been seeing... I've been seeing stats online, zero to 60. I guess what Hyundai says is either five, five seconds of zero to 60 or 5.2. But yet a number of publications have, have actually stated that uh, they're getting under five. So with this uh, VPeak OBD2 port, and we're crossing over the Merritt right now, coming over towards Talmadge Hill, uh, Boy, I used to ride this train, I don't know how many years into the city. Oh boy. But in any event, um, you know, the VPeak has a uh, an acceleration mode that is gonna be interesting to see. And I, I think that uh, I'm looking forward to see what kind of performance I can get out of this. So we'll, uh, We'll give it a shot here in a couple of minutes. So as we're about to get on the on the Merritt Parkway here in New Canaan, um, just a couple of thoughts. I didn't really go over the drive modes. I think most of you know there are three modes. There's Eco, uh, there is Normal, and then there's Sport. And um, what's interesting is, and then if you hold in the button, uh, the drive mode button on the, at least on the all wheel drive version, um, it has a snow mode, which is, which is very good. Um, I did try it out. Where did I try it out? Did I try it out? I don't know if I did. I don't think I did. Um, maybe one day we had a little bit of slop. Yeah, that's right. But, uh, nothing, nothing huge, but 
I'm in normal mode now, getting onto the Merit. Let this E-Class go by. C-Class, what am I saying? And easily, easily merging into traffic. I mean, this thing, I'm in sport mode now, and you just touch the gas pedal. Gas pedal, what am I saying? The accelerator. And this thing just jumps uh, off, the, uh, off the line. So it feels super light for being such a heavy car, obviously because of the battery weight. Uh, built very solid, no creaks, no rattles, not one in this entire car, um, which to me, uh, you know, the build quality is there. Now, granted, in the ID4, you can feel the quality and in, in some of the inside materials and all that. This car is not bad at all, though. Um, some of the hard plastics that you see throughout, eh, they're no big deal, but you know, I, I really feel like they've put out a, an exceptionally good, solid, quiet riding product here. And uh, I, I'm, I'm actually really uh, liking it a lot. So let's see, I'm going to probably get off this exit and flip it around. Um, I'm gonna put it in HDA2. Now I've got my driving style adaptive SCC. I see in the heads up display, uh, the auto steer function, it's a little steering wheel that turns green. So you know you're an auto steer. I'm gonna increase my speed up to, I don't know, something higher than what I'm doing right now. Uh, and the auto steer is, is very good. I, I would say, um, comparable to the Tesla a couple of turns it didn't navigate earlier today for me quite as well as I'm pretty confident the Tesla would but I haven't experienced phantom braking you see back there there was a a bridge and um, oftentimes the Tesla Model 3 or Model Y I think it was would would phantom brake there for some reason and I always knew it would do it um, but you know this car hasn't done any of the phantom braking which kind of freaks you out uh, in the ID4, I used to get this, this sort of pulsating. It was trying to keep the speed, uh, especially on windy days. I don't feel any of that. It's very smooth. Uh, and, and now if I put on my turn signal here, as I'm about to get off this exit, I don't expect it to do a, an exit off the road like, like uh, you know, the Tesla full self-driving will do, which I have experienced. And that's a nice feature, but, you know, it's not really... All that important. I do like the 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 ability to change lanes with HDA2. I think that's a a very very good feature. So I'm just getting off here, exit 35 on the Merritt High Ridge Road. We're in Stanford now. I'm going to shoot back up onto the Merritt, head over to the mobile gas station, and and from there that's where I'm going to do the zero to 60. So um, be back to you in a moment. All right. So here I am. Actually, this is a good spot to test the zero to 60. I'm in sport mode again. State of charge is 44 percent. It's uh, 41 degrees out. The battery temperature. Let's look at that. Uh, based on the dashboard here on this um, on this OBD2 scanner, I just want to see how warm the battery pack is. I, I've been driving it a little bit, nothing nothing crazy, but uh, my battery minimum temperature is 48.2, back maximum cells 55.4. So you know that's Fahrenheit, not Celsius, and uh, so the battery pack is not super warm and uh, the car is, is uh, obviously at less than half state of charge, 43%. Let me throw this into the acceleration test mode, and I'm gonna take off my hazards, check for oncoming traffic, leave a little bit of a gap, and then I'm going to absolutely punch it, and we'll see, wait, we gotta get to accelerator, there we go acceleration test there's a couple of cars coming so i gotta be careful here but um another car you know this traffic here what don't they know i'm trying to do a test what's wrong with these people all right here we go ready three two one bang 50 60 okay now i almost hit a pickup truck in front of me not really but uh you'll notice that there was a sound the car was telling me that I should brake, which I did. And um, on that pull, zero to 20 was 1.216 seconds. 
zero to 40 was 2.825 seconds and zero to 60, 4.837 seconds. So this thing is fast. It's definitely faster than what Hyundai says it is. I mean, I'm in sport mode. It's 42% state of charge. The battery pack is not completely warm. Um, there was no slippage in terms of wheel spin at all. <laughs> like I used to get my Hyundai Kona. Boy, if you floored that thing front wheel drive, that would light up the tire, especially if they were wet. So I'm impressed. You know, you, you when you drive the ID4, it's fast enough. I had two, raw, two rear wheel drives. They were fine, zero to 60 in seven seconds. There was a major noticeable difference between the rear wheel drive and the all wheel drive uh, ID4. I drove a rear wheel drive SE and uh, Ionic 5, uh, and that thing moved. That thing was pretty good. And, and, but I have to tell you, the difference between the Ionic 5 all wheel drive and the ID4 all wheel drive, forget about paper. You know that feeling you get of being a little nauseous when you take some of those carnival rides? Again, I always talk about Aerosmith's Rock and Roller Coaster as an example. Um, that zero to 50 or 60 miles an hour, you get that feeling in this car. Uh, now, it's not like P100D, uh, you know, Tesla or P100, uh, forget, I've not even been in a Plaid, nor do I even want to be in a, in a, in a Plaid. Um, it's just, just, in my opinion, just too much power. But, um, you know, th this thing gets you up and going very quickly and noticeably faster than the ID4. 4.837 seconds, zero to 60. And I know I could do better than that on a warmer day with a warmer battery pack with a higher state of charge. So I'm impressed, Hyundai. I like the conservative stats from your PR marketing department. I like that. So in any event, folks, thanks for watching this uh, episode of Out of Spec Reviews. Hopefully you found a couple of things in this video today that were helpful. Um, tried to go over some of my first impressions. To what's it like to live with this car for the first 10 days? I'm genuinely happy. Uh, build quality is great. I really, really like the car a lot. I like the design. It's growing on me. It's fun driving around and getting looks. I'm not going to lie. It's kind of cool. Um, and, uh, you know, look, I, I slouched down a little bit in the seat. Uh, and it's fine. I'm not... I wish the seat went a little bit lower. I guess that's my only gripe. And uh, I guess the good news is as I get older, I'm probably going to get shorter. So I got that going for me. Have a good one and thanks for watching. So I, I can't help myself, guys, but, you know, here's here we are in uh, Stanford Ridgeway. And all the way down there, you can see the EA stations. And then this large bank of 75 kilowatt urban superchargers, um, which I, I, I understand why they make sense. I mean, look, there's a stop and shop here. Uh, and if you need to go in and shop, you can put it on the hook. The problem that I have with my Ionic 5 right now is that a half hour is not enough time for me to shop. But let, let's talk about this for a second. EVgo, fast charging. They got the Chatamo, they got the CCS, and a, and a Tesla adapter there. 50 kilowatts. 50 kilowatts. This is not fast charging. I, I mean, Okay, it's better than some that are out there. Like, for example, the Stop and Shop in Darien has a, I think it's a charge point. DC fast charging, 24 kilowatts. Are you kidding me? My, my car right now, I'm on a 150. I'm pulling 135. That thing is capable of pulling 235 kilowatts. So when people say fast charging, you really got to define it. I, I'm, I'm charging basically twice as fast right now as that as that Tesla over there and and understanding these are 75s and they're meant for a certain use but 50 kilowatts let's just I'll just say this one thing if any government funding 
goes to put in DC fast charging in this country as new initiatives and all they put in are 50 kilowatt stations, that is a waste of taxpayer money. I've said it. So here I am charging at Electrify America and Stanford Ridgeway and uh, I'm at 24%. And it's uh, it's actually pretty cold out right now. Um, outdoors, 33.8 degrees Fahrenheit. And we're pulling 72 kilowatts. Now, I can tell you that in my ID4, when I would pull into the same exact charging station, this is an Electrify America. Um, I'm only at a 150 right now, just because there are a couple of 350s, but... In these cold temperatures, I'm not seeing that that kind of um, the amount of energy being pulled. But on my OBD2, the car scanner app here, you can see a couple of different things. You can see the battery minimum temperature is 35. So I think there's a hundred and there's a bunch of different battery cells in in this car, and um, this is showing the battery cell that is the coldest and this is showing the battery cell that's the warmest and this is showing what the battery inlet temperature for the um the fluids to heat up the battery is at so it's actually saying and i have this in fahrenheit forgive me kyle i know you like to think of things in celsius but my brain just doesn't do celsius quite yet but in any event uh you know the battery coolant inlet temperature coolant or heating is saying 105 and so it's um, it's trying to warm up the battery pack. Now, my understanding about this battery pack on the Ionic 5 is that it has an algorithm that is very uh, heuristically based in terms of if-then technology. So if the ambient outdoor temperature is 33.8, if the battery minimum is 35.6 and the battery maximum is 39.5, then I want to get... In this case, it's it's saying 65 kilowatts is what it's asking for. Now, clearly, this EA station can put out a max of 150, and the car is only asking for 65. So as, as this temperature here, um, the minimum, sort of your least, the weakest link in the system is your, is the minimum battery cell temperature. Um, as that comes up, then the actual kilowatts that it, that the uh, car is asking for from the EA station will uh, will go down. Now I'm charging here without any um, you know without any uh, with the car off and all of that and you can see the car display is saying 71 72 kilowatts but but realistically it's only pulling 65. Now one of the reasons why I think that's the case is because what this is showing is I believe may I may be wrong is what the what the car is actually taking in um, in terms of kilowatts but what's actually going into the battery is roughly six or seven kilowatts less than that why because it's trying to heat up the battery pack or you know if I had the heating system on or the AC on or the heated seats or whatever um, actually I think I have the headlights on let me turn those off and see if that that, that probably doesn't do anything um, I just turned the headlights off, uh, but, or I guess they were the daytime running lights, but, uh, in any event, I, I think what will happen is once the battery pack, you can start to see that it's getting a little bit warmer here. Um, and again, it, it's based off the battery minimum. Uh, once it, once it actually reaches a certain temperature, it's going to step up to a, a, to ask the charger for more power. And so let's watch what happens with that. And, uh, and we'll see. I'm currently a 42% state of charge, pulling 72 kilowatts, but that's not the reason for my update here. Uh, what I wanted to point out was the fact that a lot of people have been commenting about the fact that this beautiful car does not have a weird, a, a weird, a rear windshield wiper. And, and it doesn't. Uh, and, and one of the things that that you'll notice is that this this aero sort of spoiler, I guess in its design, is supposed to at highway speeds push the air down over this windshield or this rear wind wind uh, window and take the the rain off of it. Now, I have to be honest. I 
I've been driving the car for the last, you know, 10 days or so, and I don't really feel like I need it. Now, maybe it's the out of spec sticker that's keeping the rain off of the, the rear windscreen there or windshield um, window, but all kidding aside, I, I would not really be all that worried about it. Even when we, I know when Kyle picked up the car, it was raining that day pretty bad. And uh, yes, I mean, clearly it would be better to have that, but don't let that one thing sway you from, uh, you know, your buying decision as to whether or not you get this car. The other thing I had talked about a little bit when I picked up the car was the fact that you can put energy into the car as I'm doing now, and you can also take energy out of the car using this uh, V2L um, adapter. And I bought that, it was 600 and basically $600. Uh, and you know, when Kyle flew back to Colorado, he's like, Dad, can I take that with me? I wanna do some testing with it. And you know, for me right now, it's a little bit of a party trick. I have some ideas of what I wanna do with it in the future. So I don't have it now to demonstrate, but basically you'll put that into this charge port and you'll take uh, the energy you know, out of that charge port. Um, but one of the things that you can also do with the limited version is there is a plug, and there's been a little bit of confusion about this because in, um, I guess, in some of the specs around the country, around the world, maybe the V2L comes with it, but the limited comes with this plug adapter inside the, it's basically right below the rear seat in the center. And what's interesting is there is a, you have to take the key fob and pull the little key out of it. And then you have to uh, stick the key, let me see if I can figure this out, inside this uh, little lock thing. And then once you do that, you open up the, the charge port and you can plug something in there. Now Kyle's teasing me because this car does not have massaging seats and that was the one thing that the ID4 had that, that I loved. Yeah, I'm gonna take this before I forget it. And, uh, you know, he's teasing me because I, I, I'm, I'm saying that I'm gonna get a, uh, a little separate shiatsu massager to put on the back for the long trips. And of course, he's crazy ridiculing me about that. And uh, I gotta do it. I definitely gotta do it. Um, one of the other things that I have been reading about, and it's kind of a little bit scary to me, uh, is the fact that a lot of these, not a lot, but some of these Ionic 5s, the 12 volt battery is dying. Now, one of the, the things I, I, I witnessed this morning is that when I came out to the car, there was a little light on the dash, sort of right by the, I'll point it out to you here, uh, right here, it was an amber light that came on. And what I read about is that that is an indicator that the high capacity battery is actually charging the 12 volt battery. Um, and I, I actually uh, hadn't known that. So if you do see that light on, and, and I understand that's also only on the US spec cars, which is, would be odd to me, but um, you know, inside the frunk, this is what I am keeping in here. I've got four things in here. The first thing I've got is a, is the level one charging cable. I haven't even used it yet. Um, the second is just a uh, first aid kit. The third is this tire mobility kit. Uh, this car does not come with a spare. And interestingly enough, the tires that are on this car are not EV specific tires. They're just regular tires. Uh, I guess that means they don't have the foam in them. And you'll see down here, this is where your 12 volt battery is. And what the problem that people have been saying is that when they use the Blue Link app, specifically, I was reading this on Facebook this morning, uh, that somehow if you use the Blue Link app to open the charge port, which I'm not sure why you would do that, people are running into a problem where it puts the car into a strange funk where it actually it uh, kills the 12 volt battery. So I went to Costco 
and I bought this unit for, I think it was like $35. And it's a 12 volt battery charger. And it comes with, with the cables here. So you can actually, uh, sorry about that, connect them up. And one of the things you can do in order to gain access to the, to the 12 volt battery is, how do you do this? Uh, well, my understanding is you can pull that up. I'm not gonna do it right now, but you could, you could probably sneak the cables in there into the, uh, the ports, uh, the, the, uh, the mounting ports for this. But, um, you know, that's one thing to, I would say buy and keep in your car. I did run into when I was had my ID4. I ran into a guy who had, I think he had an ID4, and his 12 volt battery kept draining on him. And he was at an EA station, and he was locked out of his car. And uh, one of the things that you have to remember is that if you do get locked out of your car, um, you'll see right in here that you can actually uh, manually push this out of the way. And you can stick the manual key right in here to unlock the car. So a couple of, you know, a couple little tips, if you will, from a safety standpoint. Don't worry too much about the, the rear windshield wiper. It'd be nice if it had one. I would not buy the car because of that. And uh, let's see, quick update on how we're doing with our charging. Oh, that just went away. Well, whatever. So, uh... Thanks for watching. Well, just a quick update. This is kind of a weird curve. So, so the minimum battery temperature is 42.8, but yet we, we're now only pulling 58. So um, I don't know why that's the case. Outdoor temperature still shows 33.8 um, Fahrenheit, but that's weird. Like why did it go down from 70 to 58? It, 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 this is not a linear, algorithm that the engineers at Hyundai are using. I know that they are very, very deliberate with, uh, with what they're pulling from EA uh, in a very calculated manner. And, and a lot of it's to protect the battery. A lot of it's to be as efficient as possible. They're trying to balance how much energy can I put into the battery based on the current situation. But what does not make sense to me logically is when my temperature on the battery on the minimum cell goes up, why am I pulling less now? I don't know. There must be, maybe there's a correlation between the gap between the lowest battery minimum and the highest. Um, one, one thing's for sure. I, I know the guys there at Hyundai know what they're doing. So I'm not questioning why I'm pulling that, but there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into this. So, you know, listen, maybe this is a little too geeky or nerdy. I'm learning this from Kyle. I'm trying to do this on my own. But I'm trying to understand the curve as to why am I only pulling 58? You know, this car can can pull a maximum of 235 if you're on a 350 that's capable of delivering that. I deliberately went to a 150 to keep the 350s open, knowing that in these low temperatures with a battery pack as cold as it is, because I just literally started the car up this morning and drove over here for about five miles away, um, I knew I wasn't going to pull anything near 150. Uh, I, I, you know, last time I was here, similar situation, I pulled 135. So why, why go to a 350 if that's all I'm going to pull? But uh, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you see the gap now is 11 degrees between the lowest battery minimum and, and the highest. And it's possible that, that this battery cell chamber is furthest away from the inlet temperature where it's pouring out 105.8. That's hot. 105.8 degree fluids, but uh, yeah, you got 11 degree Fahrenheit temperature, and that must be why that sort of gap between those two battery cells, why it's saying, okay, only ask for 60 kilowatts. Um, interesting, very interesting. We'll, we'll update in a minute. So just a quick update, we are at a 57% state of charge, about 22 minutes into the charging session, and um, you can see that the gap between the minimum temperature and the maximum temperature is is now greater. It's still pulling, still looking for 105.8 at the inlet temperature, but it's stepped up now to uh, about 96 kilowatts is what what it seems to be pulling. Um, what's interesting about this is, uh, you know, it's it's possible. Look, I'm not going to figure out how 
their algorithm works to how much I want to, you know, accept from the uh, from the EA station or whatever station it is. Well, one thing's for sure, it probably, I saw it step up when it hit about 60, 61 degrees on the minimum. And so there may be some logic that says, all right, if the gap between the min and the max temperature is less than 20 and, you know, the uh, minimum temperature is greater than 60 degrees Fahrenheit, then, you know, let's go ahead and pull. Wow. Did you see that? Oh, look at this. Now, what is going on? Look at that. 126, 128. Okay. So what changed? I don't know. 128. 120 yeah I don't know but I'll take it keep you know keep going okay so I've finished the charging session uh, here at EA I actually went over by a minute 31 minutes 18 seconds to be exact and man I'll tell you what computers are accurate I got charged 49 cents I only get 30 minutes free so uh, be aware of that I, I got a little lazy on the uh, on the unplug Oh, well, um, yeah, so I, I pulled a total of 43 kilowatts, uh, brought myself up to a state of charge of 71%. And, um, and I can tell you that in, let's just see here, in eco mode, am I in eco mode? Now we're in sport mode. Uh, in eco mode, it's saying 178 miles of range at 71%. Now, you got to take these things for a little bit of a grain of salt, but um, it's still 34 degrees out. I pulled it at 33.8. Um, according to this uh, this um, OBD2 scanner, uh, you can see that now temperature is still 33.8. It didn't move. The battery is warmed up nicely, 78.8, 87.8. That's probably somewhere in the range of where it's most comfortable charging i would believe so in any event um you know good session here i would say interesting session uh relatively cold out the battery pack was was cold uh relatively cold i mean not like colorado cold like kyle with four degrees below fahrenheit but uh 30 you know 34 degrees fahrenheit sat overnight so uh good session here i uh, appreciate it thank you very much ea and Vo and volkswagen I, I can't get volkswagen and hyundai for my three free 30 minute charging session of which I will pay you 49 cents for. <laughs>